established its practice studio Meta in um, 2008 and they focus on sense of materiality, space and construction. Um, he's also a professor of construction in Münster University in Germany. So we'll give a big round of applause to him. Good evening and, and thank you uh, for inviting me on uh, this way from London or from Minster. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, looks like it. Because I don't I won't switch the mic on then. And often you have an echo, but it's a bit annoying. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased to, to be here with you, so, so many of you. Uh, we had an event earlier this week in Minster where we had the Dean of the Pratt Institute and um, um, the, um, the um, curator of the architecture department of the V&A and there was like 20 people. And it was one of the best events we ever had. It was uh, fantastic, but it was very intimate. So, but it's, it's a really nice uh, lecture hall and, and, and a great place to tour through the stu uh, studio survey. Um, I should say a little bit more about myself or the way we work in the office and where that, that title, the matter of scale, comes from. Um, we are minute practice. Yeah? So we're only three people. It's me, um, a half-time mother of three, and one guy in Italy who draws uh, and does sketch up with me. And I also teach half the week. And um, I, so we're minute, so that's a, an issue of scale straight away. And we like to work on all sorts of projects across different scales. And we work on things that are tiny, about this big, mechanisms for tables. And we work on projects that are about 100 million euros um, in, in size in our practice with three people. So there's a, an issue of scale there straight away. And I, I when I came, go a little tour through the studio site, I noticed I'm in the right place. You guys have no fear of scale in this school. You know, the bigger the better, Manhattan, India, uh, Randstad in Holland. You know, it can't be, you know, all the big conglomerate areas in this world, you like to tackle them. And I think that's, that's, that's fantastic, and I think that's really good. And we should do this as architects. Um, so, a bit more about myself and where I came from. Just when I was a bit younger than you, in, uh, in the late 80s, um, I grew up in Berlin. There were two exhibitions in one year that really shaped my, my experience or my desire to become an architect or a designer, or as you say in German, a Gestalter, somebody who creates shapes or forms. And one of them was Misha Rolla's 100th birthday exhibition at the National Gallery in Berlin. And the other one was, um, almost more important, um, the exhibi an exhibition about the Hochschule für Gestaltung or the um, School of Design in Ulm, um, which um, was at the Bauhaus archive in Berlin. And you can see, you know, the, this is your expectation of an architect with a big model, and that fascinated me, and I was amazed. I mean, the National Gallery was, is to me still to this day one of the most important buildings of the 20th century. And on the other hand, I liked the small thing, the razor that my dad had. You know, it was in this exhibition about this design school in all. Um, and I, straight away, I realized on one hand it's amazing to create these enormous spaces. And on the other hand, it's, a, it's, it's really interesting and really important to create something that's possibly quite small and fits in your hand, but reaches hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of people every day. They use it. It makes a difference in their lives. So I realized at that moment, you have an impact, you can have an impact in this world um, on different scales. And um, <coughs> what I'm going to do today is, I've never given this lecture before, so it's a bit of a, a 
you know, it's a, it's a trial, um, to, to bring together different thoughts about this issue of scale. And um, the first thought about this is it's about process and not about form. And to me, one of the biggest problems of especially architectural education, or the understanding of architectural education, is this man, this building, and that sentence. Architecture is a masterly, correct, and reminiscent play of maps brought together in light. So it's about a product. It's about an end result. It's about a shape. It's about a form. And I don't know, maybe not so much here. From what I've seen here, it's probably less so. But in German architectural education, it's still all about form. And we judge architecture by how beautiful it is, how, um, <clears throat> you know, how the form appeals to us. And you know, this thing could be made out of plastic. It could be radioactive. It wouldn't matter. It's this beautiful thing. And for me, much more important is this sentence. And it's um, used from the book, of course. I want to examine my thoughts in action. I want to do something in order to be able to think. And I think that is ultimately what I'm trying to do. And trying to do it at different scales, different things. So it's about making things and thinking about making those things and developing things through thought and making. So the next thought. The next thesis is, what's really important about what, anything that you do as an architect or designer, you have to understand two questions. How does it work, and how do you make it? And here I want to go back to this little man, which is my grandfather. He's a, he's a blacksmith by training. He grew up um, in the Ruhr Valley in, in Bochum, that's near football fans. It's near Schalke, near Dortmund. There's another town in the Ruhr Valley. Um, it's obviously it's, it's one of the biggest industrial areas of Europe. Um, but he grew up on a, um, a, in, a, in a sort of house of blacksmiths. And they had a small, as blacksmiths had in those days, they had a small holding um, and a, so a small farm where they had grew vegetables and had some animals. And he wasn't the eldest son, so he was the youngest, I think, so he had to do something else. He couldn't become the blacksmith. He couldn't take on his father's industry, um, <coughs> so he became a uh, mechanical engineer. And he designed um, uh, agricultural vehicles like this. I don't exactly what it is. I think it's harvests um, sugar beets or something. And he, do, he knew two things. Because he grew up on a quasi farm, he knew what you know, agricultural equipment was used for, how it worked. And because he was a trained blacksmith, he knew how to make it. So he designed his first job was developing this, this machine. It's a potato harvester. And if you Google potato harvester in German, Kartoffel oder, you still get this image. That is still the image that Wikipedia shows you as what the potato harvester, <coughs> the original potato harvester looked like. I mean, it was originally invented by two Brits, I don't know their names anymore. But he sort of refined it, developed it further. And this is here, and that's where scale comes into. When they made the, the, the th number 1000 of this in this. Um, Factory in Mannheim. And interestingly, I mean, it's just in the middle of the site, it's in the, mid, the late 1930s. And interestingly, there's not a swastika site. I don't know why, but there, there's even what it says on there, there's no mention of National Socialism. Now, that's quite interesting. That's 1,000 they produce with this thing. So you make one thing and you repeat it a thousand times. He went on to make more of these things in the 50s, and by the time he died in the 60s, he had about 20 patents. And all because he knew 
how architecture worked, what the thing he was designing had to do, and because he was a blacksmith, he knew how to make it. Another issue of scale is a response to a problem has to be scaled, or there are limits to scale. And um, you all know this picture probably by Galilei, the bone picture. The bone on the right is three times as long as the one on the left. But in order to sort of carry the three times of weight, it has to be ten times bigger, essentially. Ten times stronger. Because it's not in proportion. It doesn't, in, it doesn't grow in scale when you make something bigger. There is a limit to uh, how it works, and that's why, that's why land animals, you know, by the time you, you know, not much beyond an elephant is really possible with a bone structure and muscles, because it would collapse on its own weight. And my professor I studied in Chicago, uh, Marion Goldsmith, he did this chart in the 1950s where he analyzed bridge structures, and it's I brought this slide especially tonight because it is <laughs> the first and fourth bridge in there. And his, he noticed that particular structures only work in certain scales. So there's an optimum structure for any type of um, system. So you couldn't have a, a plate girder go anywhere beyond this is in hundreds of feet. Um, so 8,000 feet, and you know, once you go towards a kilometer of span, nothing else but a suspension bridge would really work. And interestingly, you can't really downscale it either. You know, a suspension bridge doesn't make any sense for something that only has to span 10 meters or 20 meters. And it was in the in the 90s when I was with him, and he was he hated Norman Foster. He felt he was an idiot by or Richard Rogers by doing all these suspended structures for, if you could just use a beam for the same, for the same span. And um, I, I show my students in, in Münster this picture of this bridge by Gustave Eiffel in the south of France, because it is a perfect example of how you scale the response to a different problem. You know, you see this, you know, this is the, obviously the, the, um, <coughs> the, uh, the train tracks up here, straight up there, and it's going to cross the valley of this um, uh, reservoir. And you can see, you can start out with a wall to support the tracks, then it goes too high, you use too much stone to to support the the tracks. You start a, um, a bolt, and on the other side the same, yeah? And then it gets too high, that structure is no longer sensible, it's too inefficient, you start with a post and beam. And there's a point here, and that's where it gets really interesting, um, the scale of the problem becomes too big, you can't solve it anymore, with post and beam, you need an arch, proper steel arch, and I, mean, I find that really fascinating without really sort of theoreticizing about it. He knew what to do. He knew that he couldn't uh, do the entire thing like the Romans did as a vaulted um, structure. He changed because he had the ability to do it. He was the only one in the world really who could do the maths, who could calculate how, you would, how that would work. But they actually knew how to make it. Again, Gustave Eiffel had his own construction company. He was the only person in the world who could actually build this thing at that moment in time. And maybe slightly strange piece is to control the outcome of whatever you do and whatever scale you work, you need to control the detail. You need to know how the things put together. And that's something I, I learned when I was working for David Tipperfield about 20 years ago. Um, and it's very interesting, one of the lectures I was attending with him, 
at the time, he was thinking about how, in his early work, he really enjoyed working on one idea, <coughs> working on a project where all you had time for, all you had space for, was one concept, one idea, juxtaposing three different or four different materials in this method. And then that, it's quite interesting how then this is a project I worked on in the, from 1999 to 2002, on the headquarters building in Germany, how you then do a headquarters building with one idea, with one detail. We tendered this entire project about 15 million pounds uh, worth um, with 100 drawings. The entire project was tendered with 100 drawings. It was one, maybe a handful of principal details that then got repeated over and over again. And the whole thing came in pretty much on budget and time. So it was one of the fastest jobs I've ever done. Um, and it was before the email, interestingly before mobile phones. He did this on fax machines and printed copies of drawings. Um, it was drawn on a computer, but still, so it was uh, as far as advanced that we, that we got. And then again, we have uh, Mies von Lohre, who was obsessed with details. He didn't delegate details to some junior person in the office. He pretty much sketched every single detail for all of his buildings himself. He was obsessed how they were put together, how they were made. And you can see it, you know, this details, how this thing is made. One of his first buildings when he came to America, the alumni hall in Chicago. Um, <coughs> everything, how this, the bricks slot into the steel and how this, the, the window frames slot into this, uh, this you know, attached structure on the outside and <coughs> how the, the corner worked. And it's really funny when there's I took my students to Como a few weeks ago on an excursion. I found this detail from a Roman chapel uh, um, on Lake Como, which is a, almost a carbon copy of Mies van der Rohe's detail, just in, in stone. But what's really interesting is that the entire building is defined by that detail. Everything follows from that detail. Once you know the detail, you can make the entire building. So that's uh, and develops. And then these were obviously known for these huge structures that he was able to build <coughs> as a sort of rigorous repetition of the same thing over and over again. What was really interesting, and what people not necessarily always understand, is how he was then able to scale this huge building down to the human scale. How a massive window has a horizontal just above head height, so a door fits naturally into this entire, this huge uh, office block. And something that we always struggle with these days, I find. I mean, there's so many architects I've seen that make four meter high doors that you can hardly open, that need a motor to open them and some kind of button. And it always and that baffles me. I don't understand why you need to do that. Here, you can scale down this huge thing to the height of the person. And you can easily open the door without any fuss. And as some young architect, and I think you should really invite to this office, this is not my work, this is Armbach from, from Belgium, two guys who gave a lecture in Woodstock a month ago, um, who um, I was really fascinated by their ability to control the outcome or understand the outcome through models, through visualizations, um, and, and sort of by able to control this process. I mean, I've so when I was a student, we had Sala Dick in lecture in Stuttgart, and it was just one image after another. This was in the late 80s. And I was, after half an hour earlier, I was so bored by looking at pictures that you didn't know whether they were buildable or not. And what I really enjoyed about these two guys was that they were able to, the images were, in a way, an experiment. 
a um, sort of a foretelling of what the actual result might not look like. And the actual result is never a disappointment because of that. And the models, everything fits the purpose that informs uh, the, the outcome. So, now this sort of is becoming one sort of my strange mantra. Uh, I work across different scales and I try to have one idea in one detail. And then that allows us to, to work across these different, different projects. The first one I'm going to show is um, the accomplishment of um, the Hildesheim Cathedral, it's a UNESCO heritage site, a Romanesque uh, church or cathedral from uh, 1200 years old now. And um, I didn't do the whole approach, I just worked um, for uh, Johannes Schilling, a colleague of mine in Münster, who did the whole project, and I helped him do the furniture. And this is what the interior of this Romanesque a cathedral looked like um, until well until about April, or I think it's March 1944, when it looked like that. And the cathedral was then rebuilt in the 1960s, very badly. Um, um, it looked almost like a German, um, you say it looks like a there's some very strange choices for materials. Um, and then because it had a 1,200 years, um, a couple of years ago, the, the European Union um, and the Catholic Church and everybody pitched in and decided to completely do it again. So they gutted the whole thing. It was a, a chance to basically restore the original Romanesque uh, cathedral. Interestingly, a lot of these, what you see there, is not original at all. I mean, some of the columns are, but most of them are actually made in concrete. So they've rebuilt the, um, the Roman, um, Romanesque uh, structure or the form um, in the concrete. But it was an ability to sort of bring back the floor, bring back the base of these columns. And well, the big thing was that you could then see again what it possibly looked like uh, 800 years ago or so. And rebuilding this again in concrete or rebuilding it in, in plaster. And putting back a floor that was much more like what it may have been there um, 800, 1,000 years ago. And um, the big reason for, um, and then also one of the big things was, and that's where I came in, was they wanted to get rid of these pews. And John Schilling asked me if I could help him design a chair for this building. And I said, yes, of course, I'm designing a chair. And I didn't have much to do at the time, so I said, okay, let's do that. And the reason for doing a chair in a big cathedral is because, of course, you can vary the chairs. You can't vary the pews, but you can change the chairs around for a standard ordination, baptisms, choirs, uh, weddings, all sorts of events, you can always change it around. And the problem though is there's nothing on the market. You know, this is what you usually get as a standard chair with some add-ons. And I don't know, probably not Catholic, but Catholics in Germany, they pray on their knees, raise their elbows um, um, on, the, on the front um, seat. So here's your knee rest and there's your um, elbow rest. And you, there's nothing that you can buy, it's nothing that works, that stacks, that goes in long rows. So I was really fascinated with the idea of designing something that is basically a new product. You go, this is a cathedral in walls, and the French do chairs, well I've been doing chairs in the cathedrals for a long time. Um, but they have a, the same problem like everyone, that the chairs don't line up, so they, it's really kill detail here. The French, this, the guy who runs the church there, the church wall, he put these little 
um, sticks to the back of these um, chairs to keep them all in the road so they're not going to sort of move around. Um, but we realized very quickly that we, if we want to design a chair for a church, we need to go back to the pew. We need to understand how the pew actually works. This is a, um, a pew by Rudolf Schwarz. I know an architect who may not be very well known in the UK, but he is probably one of the best German post-war architects you'll find. He has um, he's done some fantastic churches and, and public buildings. And um, the only one, in fact, who meets one of the really respected of the German post-war architect group. Um, so we try to understand how this geometry works. And then superimpose it with chairs and realize they're different in that geometry. So we need to figure out how we can reconcile the two. And we test it in our office, you know, we try to understand how it works. You know, how because I'm not Catholic, I don't you know, I don't know how you pray on your knees. And so we tried it out. I mean, he's Catholic, he's Italian. Um, so um, we tried to figure out the geometry, how, how it would work with chairs, how big a part there would be. So understanding how it would work was a big thing. We made lots of models. And you can see one of the things that started very early on was this bend in the, in the, chair, in the chair that would allow it the integration of this rest for your elbows to the chair will topple over when you lean on it. Different materials, trying out how you, you, know, you possibly make it out of steel with, with um, these sort of private seats or would it be padded. And lots of conversations with the architect that's behind the shilling. Really, you know, that's one other thing that's really important about designing stuff about the process is that you have to communicate a lot and you can just don't can't just go into your little room and do something for three months and then come back with a cool product. You have to make sure that everybody's across it and, and, and is d'accord with what you do. And then this was the result after about three months of quite intense designing and I you know, built with my, with myself my own hands. Uh, it's about this big, um, two, two chairs, standard chair, and one with an armrest, elbow rest, and a, and a sort of Danish paper court seat. You know, I wrote this myself with a, you know, got myself a YouTube clip on how to, how to do it, and get myself the cord, and then after about, it took about half a day to sort of do this. And, but it, it convinced the, the church architect. He showed that to him. And what he really liked was also this idea that you could line them up and that's where the French stick comes back into place. You have this knee, this knee rest here and you stick your chair in there, one after the other. And that's how they line up. And obviously they're also stackable, these chairs. And then you try in these horrible images how it would look in the space. And if you could still see the new stone floor, you could still see the base. If you could, you know, these chairs wouldn't be so dominant again in the space, and you could still have the sense of this Romanesque uh, cathedral um, with the middle. And then we built some prototypes. We had the, all the priests in the cathedral test praying on them. This is the church architect trying out if it works, how you do. And, um, and again, it's really important that you communicate this stuff, that you convince people, because they weren't convinced at all. They didn't want these benches. It was the architect who wanted them. They wanted benches, the architect wanted chairs, and the church architect said, okay, if you bring me a good product, we'll do it. So we made this prototype. We also checked if it would work in that space. And then we realized the geometry wasn't right. So we had lots of people trying it out and realized it needed to change. <coughs> it wasn't stable. This wasn't obviously, you like it as an architect, but obviously that joint never works. So we had to triangulate this. 
Um, and here's another aspect of, of, of scale. You know, scaling this sort of huge mass of chairs and putting variations on them. So this is the bishop's chair, and I was able to be asked to do the bishop's chair. And again, there is no really good bishop's chair out there, a cathedral it's called. And you can't find them, and even, even some of the most famous architects, you look at the, the chairs that they're designed for the bishop, they're usually quite ugly. Uh, horrible, really. And so we had to again go back to you know, one of the originals. This is in Aachen. This is probably a thousand year old chair for the Bishop of Aachen. You know, Aachen, I don't know if you know it, that's where Charlemagne used to reign. And that's his seat. Um, or Charles the Great, I don't know. And um, made from stone. And so we came up with this idea that was basically a variation of the standard chair. And it's really interesting, the, the bishop, I presented this to the bishop, and he straight away he got it. I mean, you can say whatever you want about the Catholic Church, um, and that we well, bad press for all the child abuse, you know, the cover up and all that. But one thing you can really do with church people is you can talk theory, you can talk concept. And he looked at this thing, and he got it. He was like, he, he's quoting um, Augustinus, and he was like, well, that's exactly what my role is. This chair represents me. It's, you know, with you. I'm, um, I'm a Christian, and for you, I am the bishop. And that sort of quote from Augustinus, because he came up with that straight away, and that really sums up this, this thing, that it's different and the same at the same time. And that's him, this is the photo touch. <laughs> and you see, the thing about these chairs is, and again, this is, you have to really understand what it, how it works, what it's about. The thing about this chair is, the chair is only relevant when the bishop isn't there. It's his seat. Any church becomes a cathedral as soon as you put the bishop's seat in it, a cathedral. A cathedral is named after this chair, which is the cathedral. Which means, in the moment, the bishop himself, or you know, the Catholic Church is still him, um, is in the house, the chair no longer is relevant. So it has to be go in the background here. So it's very important that as soon as he sits in it, the chair is, isn't important. So but when he's not there, his seat, you know, his seal had to be visible and all that. So, and here you can see, the, we also made these little stools for all the other uh, you know, smaller bishops and other people who sit there or sit there. And, and then the next question, how do you make it? And that's when this fantastic Swiss company comes into play, Holm Lauer's, and here in Zurich. And it's, I always like telling this anecdote uh, about the flag. Uh, I, was, I didn't know this, but they told me that when they have a foreign visitor, they put up a flag. So when the Swiss flag's up, I know they, they know I'm coming. So, um, so this was one of the days I had a meeting there, and the, the cool Swiss, Swiss flag was up. And it's, it's the oldest chair manufacturer in, in Switzerland, and probably one of them in the world. And they can do things that most Manufacturers can't do anymore. They they have they can make things that can bend wood. Um, here you see a bending machine with this guy. He doesn't do it himself, but he looks like he could. Um, <laughs> they have these machines, which some of them are 100 years old, where they cook they cook the wood for about an hour in about 80, 90 degrees hot uh, water, and then it becomes pliable for about 10 minutes. And they can bend these, these sort of pieces into these different shapes. And then they dry it for days on end until it's dry. And then it doesn't move anymore at all. So you can see all of these round things here. They've been bent. They're not cut. Obviously, they have been cut to an extent. But, um, and here you can see all the different shapes 
of the you know, different chairs I've made over the last 150 years. And, and this is how the wood comes in. It's all Swiss wood, or in the case of oak, it's usually French. So it doesn't travel the earth, it's sourced locally. And with them, we then went through all of the details again, how you put these in the row, how you make sure they don't fall out, how you hold the, the Bible or the, the hidden book, and that also, most importantly, how you make the seat. And that was one of the ladies who works in the company. Um, she didn't like the thing that I made. She said, that doesn't work. Um, and she came up with all sorts of other different patterns, and that was her suggestion. This, let's see, it's not really like it, St. Andrew's Cross, uh, was her idea to, to um, and this is in like Rome, the other one is sort of Lytics, um, this is in Lytics, and you can see how untidy it is, and how perfectly this is done. And it was entirely her idea. I can't claim any, um, any sort of ownership of that. And sort of with them, we developed this chair to a product that you can make a thousand times. And so this is then the final cathedral, just shortly before it was opened, with the, <coughs> and the pews here, and here's the sort of proud bishop's chair in the back. Um, the reason this is a UNESCO heritage site, by the way, is not because of the building so amazing, it's because of this stuff, these um, um, light, light, um, what do you say? Lights? Not lights. What do you call this? Lights? Chandelier, that's a chandelier. Um, and um, I think you can see, you see that it's, it's, and what's really important to me is that it worked, that the, the detail, the chair worked in the big scheme of this idea of bringing back the Romanesque building. And it works in different uh, environments. My favorite picture of the little football team. Um, and, and this is another way of how you vary things, how you take one idea, one detail, and work with it. That's, uh, that was something that's happened, sort of, we just also designed these confession booths. And we like the St. Andrew's cross so much that we commissioned the Swiss guys to, to cover and decorate the confession booths with these. Um, forwards of um, woven material. I think they cost as much as the car. I mean, it's incredible, but they, they liked it and they wanted it. So sometimes it's good to have the Catholic Church as a, as a command. <laughs> um, and I think that's the last um, picture of that. Um, yeah, so they, you know, they stack, and I think that's quite, I find it really interesting how you you have one detail and you can repeat it and how it works together. So they didn't really expect this chair to go anywhere, but then it became quite a success. So across Germany you find quite a few places now where they were if this is in Munich, Paderborn, um, that's a youth church, so a different, you know, not a cathedral, much more of a domestic application. And then there's a real oh, oh, okay, this thing is a success, but it's not good enough. So we went back, and there's a lot of problems here with the details. Um, they, there's a lot of things where I ask them things to do things that are really difficult to do. Like to have this flush, it's very hard even for a Swiss firm. I mean, they can do it, but it takes time. This bend is hard to do. How the rear leg connects is difficult to do. And then we, the, the way it was woven, it was beautiful, but it was really hard to do. It took a long time to make. Um, and it wasn't that comfortable, so we tried different ways of doing it. We changed how the rear leg connects to the seat. We made it round instead of having this sharp bend. And, um, we made a double seater, we had a we made a back that was uh, solid, 
in case you really need the transparency, because that is more comfortable uh, than the two lines. And then we created this family of chairs that you can now order from Garden Flowers. And um, because of these little changes, it's much easier to make. I mean, it takes them about, I think, if I remember it right, it, take, it took about like three and a half to four hours to make one chair. You know, if you measure every minute they work on it when it goes to the factory, now it's three hours. So it's a re really significant check, save, savings in time of making. And that's the family, you know, by one back. And that's just how it changed. That was the original design. And that's how you can now, if you order it now, that's what it looks like. Now, um, we go to a completely different scale. Project in London. I don't know how we're doing for time. Does it matter? Okay. You tell me where you're bored. You tell me, I can probably see it in the face or something. We'll stop, we'll stop there and I'll do it. So. Um, but this, I mean, we need to see this one because that's at the other end of the scale of what we do. That's a project that's almost finished in, in East London for a completely different client. It's, it's the property arm of one of the biggest companies in the world. And it's, a, it's, it's the way they invest their profits. And they wanted to do something cool, interesting, and invited a lot of young architects. Of, I still consider myself young, I'm 51 now. Um, uh, in, in, in the East of London, in this site, Stratford is there, the Olympic, um, the Olympic Stadium is just to the north. Yeah, and um, this this building I was just showing is, is this one here. It's a mill building from the uh, 16th, no, 17th century, and uh, this entire island here is com is being completely rebuilt. There's another building here that's sort of slightly grey, which are remaining. Everything else is getting knocked down. So the brownfield site. And there's a master plan by Archibald, uh, the London Berlin practice, which um, tried to reintroduce a typology, or is reintroducing a typology into London that's sort of been lost. It's the block with the muse down the middle. So there's these blocks, and there's the muse that, that all connect with each other. And we've been commissioned to do two blocks, this one and, and that one. But this is the one I'm going to show, the one that's on the site. And so the, the key to finding buildings in the, in the area are these mill buildings, these beautiful uh, buildings that um, are all grade two or grade one listed. And um, this is, so they're at the south end of the site, this is the north end of the site. These are two of the buildings that remain. This one is listed. It's the Schmucker House that gives the island its name. Schmucker House Island. You can see Canary Wharf in the distance. And it's one of the oldest industrial sites in London. So this is the mill building in a, in a painting from the 18th century. And what fascinated me is the sort of industrial aspect to the site. And everybody keeps looking at this sort of mill building, but I find much more interesting is this building in the back, that, that, that proto-industrial warehouse, where, you know, you can probably guess I like it because it's so repetitive, it's so made from one thing. And on the site that we're building on, it used to be this building. It's a little warehouse on the river. And that's something that we were interested in. And obviously that's not a novel idea, lots of people are interested in industrial buildings, but we really try to do it. Often we get kind of boring knockoffs and we really try to build an industrial building. And here you see the three blocks were developed at the same time by three architects. This is uh, Dr. Morris or Morris and Company now, 
That's May Architects, um, Alexini, and that's, that's us. And that's the river here on which we are placed. And um, what was important for me was to bring back or to retain the scale of London. And the scale of London is, to me, as a, as a, as a Western European, this juxtaposition, this constant break of architectural style. We <coughs> have um, Georgian terraces next to um, Victorian warehouses. And you have this Art Deco building next to some um, Victorian building. And we, we try to bring that constant change and juxtaposition into the building in, a, in an industrial way. It's these big windows, whether they are vertical or horizontal. And also, you guessed it, in my time in Chicago, I, <coughs> if I could bring back some of that into London. Um, that building still exists. This is, um, Chicago School Building and this building we've seen earlier, the Alumni Memorial Building in the IIT in Chicago. See if I can bring some of that scale, some of that detail into this building. Something that was important also was big windows, big entrances or cafes and open ground floor, reasonably grand entrances so we signify where you go into the building. And one key thing that we did was to break down this block into different blocks, smaller blocks. And these different grays, different shades of gray, represent different parts of the, the building. And, and that became a big challenge, how do you do that before it becomes artificial or before it becomes somewhat labored. And a big help in that was uh, a requirement by the client to completely industrialize the process. He wanted, or they wanted, a building that was ideally manufactured off-site and just put together on site with um, you know, a few nuts and bolts. So everything had to be on a grid. Um, no transfer structures. The entire parking that was in the basement had to, you know, cut, go through all the way to the top of the building. Or the structure had to go down. That means 8.1 meter grids throughout. And the depth of these blocks was also defined with the master plan, which caused quite a bit of problems. So I'm not going to talk about the plans of the flats, because they're not as good as they could be, because that caused a lot of constraints. Because it, um, um, as you can imagine, I mean, they're still okay as flats, but they're not something that you could really talk about. And you can see the plot then, how it's defined by the, the, the rigidity of that structure. That was a big challenge also, to because the, the shape of these blocks follow sort of more of an organic street pattern. Um, there was something about the yards that used to be on the site that the uh, local authority wanted us to retain. So you can see the different types. There's a muse that goes down the middle of the block, the block towards the river, that creates a, a little plaza, and then you, you have this ring um, of, of flats. But the idea is really to bring much more of a European understanding of how a block of, of works, and marry that up with this very British idea of a, uh, a terrace down the middle. And we, you know, we were a few more people at the time. I had to hire a couple of people, so we were four at that time, or three plus a student. Still, um, Doug and Morris had about 20 working on this, and we were three. So um, going to the presentations with Joe Morris over there, and this team of 20, and us. It's always a bit embarrassing that we still, us being built, Doug and Morris, Morris and Compass isn't yet built, so we, we got there. Um, so, how do you do it when you serve a few people and design something that's actually quite big? 
Yeah, no, that's a um, Forty million pounds or something construction cost. Um, you, we really enjoyed this idea of prefabricating this thing. So we travelled the UK with and met with a number of precast manufacturers. This is um, uh, Macaulay Lamington's building in near Euston in London, which was being made when we went to see the factory, which is really interesting. So we went to see it, how they made this stuff, how these huge pillars were created. So we understood all the rules about how that's done, how thick the concrete has to be, how you, how you put these blocks of bricks in there, and how it then gets filled with concrete, and, and how that's made. And then we created four different facade typologies, based, all based on this 8.1 meter grid, and based on this whole notion of making the entire thing out of precast panels. And we defined every single joint in these buildings. So we didn't do the execution joints, that was done by a different firm. But we told them exactly every single joint that we wanted. Um, in, and how it was going to be made. And that was only possible because we spoke to all these people. We researched exact, in, in detail how these panels are made. And we then, as one does, creates a loop board of materials. But then we were, we could tell exactly how they were made, and that was not just some how the architect likes it. This is something that we knew would work. It wasn't going to be cheap, but we knew it would work. In brick, in concrete. And only then we hired the hired the, the why they hired these very fancy visualization people. And then made these images of how the thing might, might look like. That's the architects in the back. And but I could tell you. I don't know, top of my head, but I knew exactly every single joint, every single piece of concrete that was going to be used to make this, make this thing. And um, the side, <coughs> these are different sides to this building. You can see the different, oops. There's a brick version, there's a concrete version, <coughs> more classical, and there's a more industrial, more structural, more muscular um, version of it. But they're all based on the same grid. They're all based on the same window size, big, large windows. So they follow the same grid, but they are slightly varied to, to be able to create this, recreate this scale that you would find in London. And then they made this, they made them um, in Newcastle, or not in the Doncaster, I'm sorry. And obviously we did our drawings and then they were done by the executive architect and then they did their drawings for this on site. But these these what's really what I find really gratifying about this is that these panels have exactly that geometry that we, the four of us in our little office on Rick Lane in London envisioned them to be. This wasn't this isn't different from what we thought they might be. So this is exactly what we said they might be. I mean, some details we didn't all draw. But the big thing of it, the geometry and how they would slot together, that's something that we thought about. And then that's inside. With the original structure was thought we would like them pre cast them as well. They were done with in situ, where you can see how these panels then get at, attached to the outside of this building. And I find it really enjoyable then to see this, the building come along. And to me, it's, it's not sort of a down, a letdown from what great image I might have created. It's almost the construction is as, as good as the end result.
So we, we continue to do the work in this sort of vein. I'm working with the chair people now on, on folding tables. This element's about this size. <coughs> it's not going to look like that, so we don't worry. I'm so not showing you any secrets that might turn up. So, um, like a, you know, tables, chairs, folding chairs, the conversion of timber and folding chairs, other more domestic chairs or chairs you could use in a, in a dining room or in a cafeteria. Well, then we got this other job, and that's the last one. I'm quickly going to run through this because it's even bigger. This is, this is 100 million euros, 70,000 square meters, and it's three of us working. And one of us is a part time mum, three boys to look after. And, and the client's happy. They're really happy with what we're doing, it's, which I think is, should really encourage all of us that this is possible. And it's really it's possible because we listen to them. We know, we try to understand what they want, what's important to them. And obviously there are idiot clients out there, they're good clients. I like them. And I think they have the right values. So I understand what they're trying to achieve. And <clears throat> so in this case, there's rules. They've got lots of rules about how they want to build stuff. And you have to understand, if you don't go against those rules, you're not going to get anywhere. It's a master plan. There are references, there are lessons learned from previous buildings that they made where things didn't go the way they wanted. So they try to continually improve um, the, 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 it's almost like a product, it's almost like a chair to them, these buildings. So <clears throat> this is an office building in a big hotel. And just as an example, and it's the, um, um, this would be RBA stage two. I think in Britain, RBA stage two, maybe you do 200, one to 200 drawing, with a bit of a notion of where the columns might go. Here, we know every shaft. We know every column, what size it is. Uh, we, we know exactly how many lifts the the um, frequency, this has been checked through by a uh, fire engineer. So this is pre-design. This is concept design. But we wouldn't do a concept without really knowing that it actually will work. So this is three buildings. This is a 17-story office tower, it's a hotel, and that's a six-story office building. And again, what we did was developing the like 8.1 meter grid, so based on 8.1 meter. Um, we developed a concept of how you could make a facade for these three different buildings that it's all based on the same geometry, all based on the fact that they don't want any more than 50% glass, because it costs too much to cool or heat. Um, they need a volume every 1.35 meters. They want solar shading, um, they want a buildable. This is in Romania, by the way, I didn't say this is so in Bucharest. So it had to be built in, a, in, a, in Bucharest in a, with, a, with the type of labor, the type of company you possibly have that. And so we developed these different facades. Again, I know exactly every single joint in there. And I've discussed it with a facade consultant, a local facade consultant. <coughs> And then we start to sort of see what it might look like. And that's already there. And then now it's just the stuff in the back. So this is commercial architecture. This is not great. This is not something that, you know, where people sort of spend lots of public money. This has to be on budget, on time, very specific group. I like, I like, I like, I like, I don't like the building. I like, I enjoy working there. I like working to these very precise constraints. 
the Swiss are the, the Swiss guys in, in you know, near Zurich are the same. They work to very precise constraints. And that's it. So thank you for listening. So I'm happy to take any questions. I think that's it. that's what you do. You have questions and you have a beer. <laughs> yes. Um, so at the start of your, your talk, you spoke of your grandfather's designs um, and how he started to uh, understand that work through how it works and how it developed as well. Yeah. Um, and that's obviously something that we'll look into as, as architects of how um, a project will. How, yeah, how a project works in terms of its, its use and, and its users. So how do you, and you touched on it a little bit, so what's your process in terms of learning how a product or a building should be working for its, its use and its users as well? That's a very good question. Because as, you know, my grandfather obviously was a blacksmith. Mm. So he knew from the age of, I don't know, whenever he joined his father in the smithery how he works steel, and how you how you sort of put a, a horseshoe on a horse and all these things you knew or how you repair a plow. That and he's learned that since he was a child. As architects or designers, we don't have that often. Um, we have to immerse ourselves in new things that we don't know about. I didn't know anything about precast construction before that project. Very little actually. Um, I mean obviously the the building I did at Chipperfield was the precast, but that's, that was very different. It was a very fanciful thing, these sort of big frames. Um, but you immerse yourself in the technology. I mean, it's really important that you decide with your client how you're actually going to make it. That's, it's very, you can't work that way <coughs> and say, okay, we're going to tender it in a variety of different ways. That's what people in Britain often like to do is they sort of just tend their picture. And they say, this, we want it to look like that, and they ask the contractor to tell them how to make it. And that usually ends in disaster, I think. Or the end result being much worse than what you thought it might be. And, um, so you, you go to these people, you go to these manufacturers. So we tour, we, I think we saw at least three factories one in Holland and two in Britain talk to at least four or five suppliers and always ask them, how, how thick is your concrete? How do you fix the bricks in the concrete? How big is the maximum panel? How heavy do they need to be? And so on. We did, I mean, I didn't have to say, I did hire um, Atelier One, the engineers, to help because I, that was a bit beyond my comfort zone. So we had their help to research this. Um, and with, with the chairs, um, when, whenever I go, I mean, I, they don't, they, he doesn't do it anymore, but the, the director of the chair company, I think the first three or four times I went to see the factory, or went to see him, went there for a meeting, he took me on a two hour tour of his factory. We started in the, where they store the, the wood, where it comes in, and we ended in the show. So, it, went, so I, it was really important to him that I would understand exactly how these chairs are made. And it's, it, is, it makes a big difference. I mean, if you go back, and stacked and so on, 
um, they get lots of marks. And you should have a, a little edge to it, this slightly rounded corner. And they make this rounded corner with a router. And in order to make this crossbar flush in the back, they need to stop the router and start again. And you can't do this with a computer. They have to do this by hand. So there's a chap standing at the router machine, and he has to mark the back leg first, where to stop the router, then stop, start again, push through. And you can imagine that it's quite difficult to do, and it does go wrong from time to time. So in these tours through the, through the factory, um, I was explained all these things. So when we, when we redesigned this chair, or developed the design further, we had a very clear brief of what needed to be done to it in order to make it more, um, yeah, better to build. And I think the result is better. I like it a lot better now, also with the round um, back today. This edge that I had in there before, this, this very sharp edge here, was again very difficult for them to, to finish. Um, they, the way they sand these, these, these chairs is when you, when you touch them, you, you feel like it's not wood. You're feeling like you're touching some kind of marble or something. It's really amazing, the finish quality. And that's very, very difficult to do with an inward bend. So the rounding that out, like that, makes it much better uh, to build. The only thing that I, I don't sh show it, um, that I got them to do was, um, they're not parallel up there. And they accepted that. I'm sure you see it anywhere. You can see it in this picture. This surface here is at a different angle than the leg and bottom. And that change in angle is, is hard to do for them because they can't sand the thing down on the machine. They have to turn it. And they have to turn it by hand to get the different change in angle between the top and the bottom. But then again, that's something they're quite proud to do because that makes them difficult to copy. So a Chinese firm or, or anybody um, who would try and copy this chair would find it very difficult to do because there's, some, there's a few things in there that are really quite hard to do and you have to have a lot of experience. So it's, it's, you have to really immerse yourself in this process and become almost an expert yourself. Like I'm explaining that to you, I have to make it. I mean, three years ago I had no idea, and I've had one. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, did you go on to the factory visit before the work for planning commission? Um, to know the size of the bridge, um, and what the manufacturer was able to build. I think so. I try to remember the timing, but I think so. Um, I, I mean, especially with the job we're doing now in Bucharest, is that is nowhere near planning application yet. Um, well, it is getting towards that now, but we've been speaking to all these different consultants for, for a year and a half now to really understand that every single detail works. And I, I, I think that that's really important. I think when, you, when I see the projects you guys have done here, these sort of massive infrastructure projects, and, and I think it's what's really important is that you make yourself, you clarify that what you try to do is possible so you don't look like an idiot. Essentially, that's what it comes down to. Because you look a fool if you do, if what you try to propose doesn't work. And, and quite interestingly, I mean, I don't really say this normally, but um, the contractor changed something on that building in East London. One of the facades, they talked the client into changing it from precast into hand laid bricks. And normally, you would think that's a great idea. But they didn't think through all of the details. And it, 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 you know, they built the half of the facade before knowing all the details, before knowing the usual, what happens, usually what happens in the UK 
of construction sites. They sort of make it up as they go along. And they were chasing their tail. And they're regretting it to this day that they ch made that change. So it's a really, that's really quite <coughs> important. Yeah. So do you need to special knowledge in terms of pre cuts concrete panels to give you a sense of like, authority to get, to get what you want? Like when you're talking to contractors and having these discussions, I don't know if you've got to convince them to follow your ideas. Great. Um, the, what's interesting I find is, is that if you precast concrete is a very specialist field. In, I don't know, in the UK, I don't know, maybe there's half a dozen who are really good at it, uh, who could do this sort of thing. And, and it's, it's really important that you speak to them quite early on and you have them on board. But I think at the time I also felt I needed backup. So I hired, I spent a lot of money of my fees giving to these sort of engineers who did this market research for us. And then they put their stamp on the on the report and then it had it was a report this sick and you could slam it on the table and here you go client and you really looked into this. Because in the end it was the client you had to convince to go with. And it was really important the client always came with us. We always went together to talk to these contractors. There's nothing you can these are these are really core cool decisions on the project that's something you could never do on your own. I would because if you lose people, and that's what went wrong with this job, is that the, the, there was a general contractor who then did the numbers. He said, oh, God, oh dear client, we can save you, I don't know, 10% of your facade cost by hand laying this. And the client said, well, yeah, that's, that's uh, you know, we're under pressure, it's going to cost more than we thought we, they might. And then there we go, they went with that. So you don't win all these battles. But I, you know, so the clients have learned his lesson. But it's, you don't, I think authority is something you don't really have as an architect. And you're not a neurosurgeon, where you, this, you're this sort of expert on the, the barrister. Who knows, you know, you're just somebody who you intrinsically trust, who intrinsically has authority. I've, I've never found that. Even when I was with David Chipperfield, I mean, he was somebody, I find it quite impressive. He always was earning the client's trust. So, he, by taking the client with him on these decisions, and that was always something that, that was quite important. So you have to bring these people with you. I was quite nervous in the beginning with these precast panels. There was a lot of questions. Of how heavy are they? How you, you know, what type of crane do you need to put them up? All these questions you have to figure out. They, they weigh a lot. They weigh ten tons. These things. So. so. Thank you. Is that it?